Our theme throughout the course has been that the smallest level properties are giving rise to the biggest level properties. Now let's actually start in applying that to come up with some big macro scale observables like boiling point based off of the behavior of our very small molecules or atoms. I'm going to start with this thinking about polarizability. Now polarizability of your individual atoms are going to dictate the polarizability of your whole molecule. Now what exactly does that mean when we unpack it a little bit? Remember polarizability is how squishy the molecule or atom is for pushing its electrons around. If it doesn't let the electrons slide around very much, it's not really going to allow an imbalance in the charge. So you're not going to have a slight positive and a slight negative because you weren't able to get the electron moved around at all. So if it's big and squishy, it's going to be a pretty polarizable atom, and that means the molecule as well will be pretty polarizable. And if it's polarizable, we're going to have more intermolecular attractions. Remember, we turn on the ability to have your ion-induced dipole, and your dipole and induced dipole, and our London forces. Remember, if I bring something like, well, let's take argon. If I bring an argon atom close to another argon atom, they're noble gases. We're not expecting them to bond or anything. But if we're thinking about how easy it is to cool them down to the point where they condense as a liquid, versus how quickly they just boil off and evaporate. What we need to think is, how well can they stick to their neighbor? If it's big and squishy, they can start doing that induced dipole very well. And so, the London force will be very large. So you'll have big dispersion forces. So as you go from helium down towards xenon, it's going to be really hard to, uh, helium's going to be really hard to have stick to its neighbor. Xenon should be pretty good at sticking to its neighbor. So we expect that Helium's boiling point is going to be really low. When we get to a really big atom, like xenon, we expect its boiling point to be comparably high. I mean, we're only at you know, negative 110 degrees Celsius there, which sounds like I'm being sarcastic when I say only, but that is pretty warm when we're talking about things. It's not like helium where you're getting close to absolute zero for its boiling point. Now, we also can say that we expect our boiling point to increase with molecular mass. So as we go down a group or left in a period, we're expecting the boiling point to start going up. Now that's not the reason that we expect it to go up. It's not the mass of it causing the boiling point to go up. It's that when we went from small mass to large mass, we got more polarizable, and as a result, the boiling point went up. So we're really kind of saying, because of this trend, we see this other trend that gives us the trend we care about. And what about when we have something like a diatomic? Well, notice that we have fluorine gas, not very polarizable. Massively electronegative, only covalent because it's the same atom on the other side. It's going to boil pretty cold. Get down to chlorine gas. You're actually starting to get to a boiling point that's not a whole lot below room temperature in terms of the grand scale of things get to bromine and actually you're above ambient temperature. When you get to iodine, you're well above ambient temperature. So you're expecting iodine to be a liquid or a solid now. And that's all based on this molar mass for each of those molecules, at least at first blush. But then moving on, we say, no, it's not really because of that. It's because we have so many protons that we have lots of electrons. That means the outermost electrons can be squished around very easily because of the inner shell shielding. And that means we have a really polarizable molecule.